Jeremiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, 1st, 2nd, Thessalon 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation. <laughs> kind of stumbled on that one. So at the age of seven, I could recite those 66 books of the Bible, the names of them, in uh, about 19 seconds. That's as fast as I ever got. It was required of us because my father got tired of waiting for the kids to find the passages he was preaching from. And afterwards, if one of the kids took too long looking up the passage, my father would pause in his preaching, cast a gimlet eye on the offending child, and demand somebody smack that kid. In 1991, what's that, 22 years ago, my father led the church that he preaches at to stage a protest against gays at Gage Park in Topeka, Kansas. The nature of the uh, protest uh, so enraged the community that it turned into a fight that lasted for several years before they finally branched out to the broader community. The basis of that protest is basically that the entire world is doomed for supporting gay rights. Today, this tiny church of approximately 50 people led by my father is known not just throughout America, but across the world. Their campaign has expanded to picketing funerals of American soldiers and major disasters like 9-11, uh, Hurricane Katrina. There's, uh, there was talk that they were gonna be at the Boston uh, bombing uh, funerals. I don't know if they ended up showing up there. And then this, ish, this incident down in Texas recently. They also announced uh, their intention of picketing at Steve Jobs' funeral um, when he died, what was that, several years ago, I guess now. And uh, their reason for that was that, that Jobs had a platform to preach the gospel and he didn't use it. The interesting part of that story is that they announced their intentions using their iPhones. And another side note, uh, one of the uh, Ku Klux Klan's websites put right on the front cover that they, uh, they added a disclaimer that they uh, denied any involvement with the Westboro Baptist Church or any support for it. <laughs> so now they're more radical than the KKK. Most people coming into contact with them for the first time, I imagine most of you here have had several opportunities to see them. Generally, the reaction is to stare at them in stunned amazement. But for me, it was a uh, natural progression from the things that I saw and experienced when I was growing up there. My father's theological me message was fed to us from infancy. We had a blackboard in the, in the dining room, and there were verses on it. We had to memorize those verses. We had books and, and uh, records with stories of the violent um, New Testament stories. And they were prolific throughout the house. And then there was this uh, sign that sat in the vestibule of our church the entire time I was there. Had a corner broken off of it. I don't know where it was originally being used. But the sign had a passage from the book of Hebrews that said, It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So this is the nature of the message that we were getting as we were growing up there. We literally were in the church pew from the day we were born, twice on every Sunday. And I recall uh, about the time I was eight years old, I was sitting in church one Sunday evening and my father was preaching about hell and um, eternity and the worm that eats on you never dies. And uh, as I was wont to do often when I was listening to my father, I kind of went off on my own tangent and I started thinking, I gotta, I'm gonna get my mind around this idea of eternity. So, eight-year-old mind, and I'm, I'm trying to think as, as far out as I can imagine in my mind, and then I, I double that and then triple it, and pretty soon I'm in tears because it's a terrifying thought. And it was at that point that I realized that the walls, the emotional and 
fearful walls were already being built in my mind. So tonight I want to take you on a journey. This journey starts with the doctrines of my father's belief system and how his interpretation of a book impacted the minds and hearts of his wife and children and eventually much of the world. Then I want to tell you about my own beliefs and how in these past 35 years I found a way to subdue the voices and the ideology of my past with reason, understanding, and a deliberate rejection of ideas that are harmful to other humans. My father is a self-styled primitive Baptist. He adheres to the teachings of John Calvin. Most of you here know John Calvin, heard of him. It's a branch of the Protestant Reformation that uh, uh, kind of removes itself from all of the other branches because uh, it, uh, Calvin had the, what he called the tulip doctrines, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the state, saints. And underpinning all of this is this idea of absolute predestination. And absolute predestination posits that in the council halls of eternity past, an all-knowing, all-powerful God made the decision which people would be born and, and die and go to heaven and which would die and go to hell for eternity. It appears completely arbitrary to humans, but it doesn't matter because humans are irrelevant because they're dead in the trespasses and sins. So from this foundational belief over the years, my father developed a complete belief system that he argued was the only accurate belief system in the world. It's important to understand this whole notion of absolute predestination and, and the ideas that spin off from it. Uh, an example of, of the argument that, uh, one of the arguments that comes from that is he was in, um, he was on the radio in Southern California in the, in the mid-1990s on a Christian talk show. And the uh, fellow that ran that talk show was a popular uh, Christian advocate at the time. His name was Ritz Bueller. And he's challenging him on the fact that my father didn't have any adherence to his faith other than his, his immediate family. And my father said, well, that's not the test. The test is fidelity in preaching. All I'm supposed to do is preach, and then God does the saving. He used to say all the time in church, if God don't want you, we don't want you. So Bueller says, well, what about this passage in the New Testament that you'll know them by their fruits? And there was a pause in the discussion, and, and my father uttered this profound debate-ending theological imperative that is the cornerstone of their religion. He said, well, Rich, you're just wrong. <laughs> we were taught that the only true Bible was the King James Bible. I remember for years I wondered, why was he so uh, adamant about that? And I realized later that it was because he had done so much parsing of the words of that particular Bible that if he allowed any other Bible to have any kind of legitimacy to it, his whole theology would fall apart quickly. <laughs> every thought and deed in our lives were laced with moral implications. Every decision was a decision for or against the will of God. We were not to be of this world, but separate from it. Look at what the world does and assume that it's evil. We were separated in every way that my father could uh, figure out to do it. Uh, when, the, when the classrooms were celebrating Christmas, or singing Christmas carols or whatever, then we had to leave and go down to the library. That was all part of that idea that we had to be separated from the rest of the world, that it was an us versus them mentality. And then we were required to perform better than anybody else. Not so much because of personal accomplishment or a sense of of pride, but to prove that we were different, that we were, in fact, God's chosen ones. Childhood indiscretions took on profound implications that reverberated down the halls of eternity. When we misbehaved, our father would rage for hours that we were sons of Belial, workers of iniquity, pawns of Satan, sinning against the Most High God. These were for childhood indiscretions. We learned that our hearts were deceitful, desperately wicked that we were inherently evil with no good in us. Our education about the world was profoundly colored by this fundamental message. But one of my earliest doubts that I was growing up there was the question, 
If the Adamic race is so thoroughly cursed, why is it that we turn to the writings of members of that same race to find our salvation? From behind the pulpit, our father raged every Sunday. He'd build up a straw man about this organization or this ideology or this individual, and then he would tear it down. He taught us that since God hated him, we had to hate him. One insidious consequence of this practice was to ingrain in our minds that the very tools of discernment that we're born with are evil. We learned not to trust the process of reasoning as it would raise ideas that contradicted the one truth from God. If a reasonable idea surfaced, but it was contrary to the ideas that we'd been raised with, we were taught to challenge it and to fear it. For years, this was a profound barrier for me. As I tried to evolve and define the world as I saw it, I continually rejected or minimized fundamentally sound ideas for fear that they were spiritually evil. But there was another aspect of growing up within the walls of Westboro. Any violation of Fred's rules puts you at risk of being beaten or ostracized. When I was a child, we heard constantly in, in the pulpit that if we left, if we ever made the decision that we weren't going to be in that place, that we'd be cut off. And it was kind of an act, it was difficult to get your mind around that as a child. I mean, you understood that the threat was there, but to really understand the consequences, years later, after I had been gone for a time, I realized that you start developing these phobias. You, you, you no longer have the support system with you. You don't have uh, the financial or the moral support. And you, you uh, start asking questions, you know, what was wrong with me? Why did an idea that I had, had in my head cost me so much? But perhaps the most uh, profound aspect of all this is that uh, after 18 years of hearing this message, you are convinced that, the, uh, that God is waiting at the gate to smite you. And that if you leave, that your protection from God's anger is no longer there. So you go through life wondering why he chose you for this particular fate. And when is he going to strike? How much is it going to cost you? And then you're going to die. And you get it for eternity. So I mentioned a minute ago the, uh, the, the risk of being beaten. Violence was a fact of life in our home. When I was about to the age of reason, my father made the decision that he was going to go back to school and, he, and uh, get his law degree. And he had that responsibility as well as the, the uh, large family. I think there were 10 of us at the time and his wife. So we ended up getting hooked on amphetamines. And then he started taking barbiturates to come down at night. And it turned him into a really violent, dangerous person. But he managed to get through law school, get his degree, and, uh, but after a couple of years, he ended up with a, uh, ethics charges brought against him and he got suspended from practicing law for two years. You've all seen my uh, nieces and nephews, the little ones that are carrying the signs at, at the protests. <clears throat> when I think about that, I'm reminded of a couple things that happened after he was suspended. Um, he had this tendency to use his children to get what he needed done in his environment, in his life. So he made the decision that um, we would uh, start selling candy, ostensibly for the church to buy a new piano and organ. But after a couple of years, uh, people started asking, you know, when are we going to buy that organ? So we kind of uh, wore out our welcome there in Topeka. We ended up going out to other communities like Olathe and, and Lawrence and and uh, bigger cities like Wichita and, and Kansas City into uh, Oklahoma and uh, north into Nebraska. And one of the other things we discovered during this process is that people are a little freer with their money when they've had a few drinks. So on uh, Friday and Saturday nights, we would be uh, peddling chocolates for the Lord in the, in the bars around town and the uh, strippers would be performing just a few feet away. Now, I, I'm not complaining about the uh, scenery, <laughs> but it did give uh, 
rise to some questions about the consistency of my father's message. And then on the first anniversary of his suspension, I came home from school, and my mom was sitting in the vestibule of the church, and my brother Mark was standing there rubbing her back, and she had a stocking cap on her head. And she pulled the stocking cap off, and her hair had all been chopped off. She had had long black hair. It had been chopped off. There were places where you could see her scalp, and then there were other places where it was one or two inches. It was a real butcher job. And it really didn't occur to me at that point that this was an act of violence, that this was a cruel thing that my father had done. And the thought that I went to immediately was this, uh, what I'd heard my father preach so much about uh, 1 Corinthians 11, about the hierarchy of authority from God to Christ to man to woman, and that women were to be in subjection to their husbands. And uh, they were to demonstrate that subjection by having long hair and having their heads covered in church. And my father had defined long, or that, that word long, he had interpreted it to mean uncut. So women were never to put scissors to their hair. A sign of a submission was that they kept their hair long and uncut. So when he cut her hair off, the message I got was that he had absolutely, absolute authority and power over our very salvation. Women were second-class citizens in the church and our family. My father proclaimed that adamantly, with no room for compromise. The Bible was clear on the subject. Eve had been deceived by a snake and was therefore the weaker vessel. Folks, that's funny. <laughs> Eve was deceived by a snake, and therefore all women are the weaker vessel. It's amazing to me that we don't just laugh about that when we hear that, you know, but that's part of what's in our culture. That's the ideology that we've been raised with. So it doesn't seem so weird, but folks, that is weird. <laughs> Paul bolsters this misogynistic attitude in a lot of the, the letters that he wrote in the, in the New Testament, that women are to be in subjection to their husbands. And my father assumed from that that he had the right to bring her back into subjection if he felt that she had strayed. Yet when he turned his instructive fist on my mother, I instinctively felt internal conflict. For me, it was intuitively wrong that a man who was six foot two and 250 pounds had the right, had the God-ordained right to beat a woman half of his age. The question for me was how could the creator of the universe justify that? During this debate that just happened, I was really struggling with that whole issue because on the one hand they talk about how God brings order, brings justice. And I can guarantee you folks that's the last thing in the world I saw growing up in that situation. But his so-called discipline didn't end with our mother. He was a strong believer in spare the rod, spoil the child. He had a barber strap and the last three or four inches of it had been so worn down that when he would spank the child it would whip around and tear the skin off the, the hip. But he got tired of that or didn't think it was effective enough, so he started using a Maddox handle. It's a uh, four and a half put fe foot piece of wood with about a 13, 14 inch circumference at the business end. And he would swing that like a baseball bat when he was beating the kids. <clears throat> Oftentimes when he was beating us, you know, it could last two or three hours, depending on how much of a rage he was in. He would start by beating the kid physically, and then he would yell and scream for a period of time, and then he'd go back to him with the Maddox. And the effect of that was that the skin would get all swollen and tightened up from the initial round of blows, and then when he hit, started hitting him again, it would just split because the force was too much, and it would ooze this kind of bloody, clear liquid. And if he didn't have the mattock readily available, he, would, he was uh, willing to use his fists and his, his feet. He used to grab the kids when, um, when he was beating them and grab them by the arms and lift them up and pull, put his knee into their stomach. He found that had a remarkable capacity to restore order. So as I grew in that situation, my doubts grew with me. I can't really say I didn't believe him, but there were questions that were constantly coming up. And as the doubts grew, my defiance grew. And the one thing you did not do in that, in that environment is defy 
that absolute authority. So there was a lot more violence coming my way as I grew into my teen years. He had this uncanny ability to, to justify his arguments with the ver verses from the Bible. But I was always asking the question, how was it possible that the best God had to offer the world was this raging, hateful ideology? Even as I wrestled with the faith of my father, there was a large part of me that had accepted his pronouncements about who I was and what, what was going to happen to me. And I think this is something that all of us do. We tend to have our idea of the world and who we are in it uh, mirrored to us by our parents or you know, our caretakers. When we, when we look at the Westboro Baptist Church, we hear terms like brainwashing, cult, indoctrination. But what do those words mean? Aren't we all indoctrinated? But there were issues there. There was the, the issue of isolation, the repetition of the message, the violence and the threats of violence, both here on earth and eternally. There was that whole us versus them message that we heard. And then there was the unnatural consequences. I talked about being ostracized. So which of these can be addressed when we try to figure out what's the difference between the proper way to raise a child and when you're really indoctrinating or brainwashing a child. I believe for me it's the arbitrary consequences and the violence that separates out a so-called normal upbringing from groups like my family. Arbitrary consequences, natural and supernatural, that create a situation where real choice becomes impossible. I understand that Greta said earlier that put it so eloquently that consent is saying yes when you have the power to say no. Well, I find that similarly that the freedom of choice is choosing when you have, when you have the power not to choose. And that power did not exist for me when I was a child. As I began to consider leaving, it was necessary for me to hold on to the idea that if I left that I was going to die and I was going to go to hell and that my eternal fate was sealed. But for all these reasons I've talked about, and so many more, I did make the decision when I was about 16 and a half that I was going to leave. We actually used the term runaway, which is really quite amazing when you think about it for an adult to talk in terms of running away. But I knew that if I was going to do it, I had to wait till I was 18. So about 17 and a half, I found an old Rambler Classic for sale for 300 bucks, and I bought it and hid it. And I packed up all my belongings slowly over the, the uh, final months. And then uh, on the night of my 18th birthday, I waited till everyone was asleep, 10.30, 11 o'clock, went and got the car, backed it into the driveway, loaded it up, and then I went back in the house. And at the bottom of the stairs leading up to my father's room, there's a long wall that had five refrigerators and freezers. And above them was a, an old red clock that had been there my entire life. So I stood there for the last five minutes of my life at uh, the Westboro Baptist Church and I watched that clock go around and as soon as it struck midnight I turned around and walked away so thank you. It took me about five years to get my life in order you know fits and starts two steps forward, one step back, and I finally moved to Southern California in 1981. And I met a woman there. She had been married before, so I knew that if I was going to marry her that I would be labeled an adulterer, but I figured by then I had done enough damage with God, so one more wasn't going to make much difference. So I asked her to marry me, and uh, we got married in 1986, and a month later, she told me she was pregnant. And uh, another fear that I'd always lived with and had never talked about was, well, I shouldn't really call it a fear. It was just an assumption that I'd made that um, because I had left that I wasn't ever going to be able to have children because my father had made it so clear that children were a gift from God. And since I was not in hadn't found God's favor that I wouldn't have kids. So when, when she told me she was pregnant, there was initial 
excitement, and then there was instant fear because I was satisfied at that point that um, God was going to figure out some way to punish me by killing that child before it was born. So when little Tyler was born in June of 1987, it was about the closest thing to a miracle that ever happened in my life. And then 18 months later, we had twins. And I was revisiting the idea of miracles. <laughs> my world shifted as I took on the job of raising these three young miracles. And I was determined that they would know love and inclusion, that they would never doubt for a moment the unconditional love of their father. At the same time, I began to ask questions because I'm having all these feelings and all of these emotions and, and thoughts and ideas about these children that are mine. And I'm thinking, how can a person feel this way about another human being and treat them the way our father treated us? So then naturally your mind goes to there's something wrong with you. So I went to a counselor. I found a counselor with a theology degree as well as a psychology degree. We spent about a year together and went through about a two-year uh, theology course with all the books that he was having me read. And I was able to start unraveling the hypocrisy of my father's religion. And then I joined a local evangelical free church because I thought it was necessary to, to make sure that my kids felt a part of the community. And I wanted to find this kinder, gentler God of Christianity. So I prayed night and day for a sign that this God was there and that he cared. His silence took me deeper into the theology. I became an outspoken apologist for Christianity by day, but at night I still worried and fretted. I spent sleepless, anxious hours playing violent confrontations over in my mind with my father as I tested new ideas, but could never quite grab a hold of them and make them my own. My depression got worse. I went back into counseling and I was diagnosed with PTSD. He advised me I should go into a mental health hospital. I, I spent two weeks there and left there satisfied that the only way I was ever going to deal with this problem was to forget it, to ignore it. So I went back to church and Bible study. And then over the next 10 years, uh, several events happened that kind of highlighted where I was going in my journey. In 1994, we were, um, it was Christmas time of 1994, and I had my three children with me and we'd stopped at a pizza hut to get dinner. And as we waited in the car for our order, Christmas carols are playing on the radio and Tyler suddenly asked me about Jesus. So I thought that I had spent enough time and had enough understanding about who this kinder God was that I would explain it to him and that he would embrace it. So I started talking about heaven, this wonderful place that we all go to and suddenly Tyler interrupted he said, well, what about people who don't believe? Bless his atheist little heart. <laughs> so I told him, well, kind of caught me off guard. I said, well, actually the Bible says they go to a place called hell. And he said, well, for how long? And I said, for eternity. And he said, well, how long is that? And I said, well, that's forever. And he started crying. And then the twins started crying. And then I started crying. So I went home and talked to my wife and I decided I wasn't gonna send the kids to church anymore. I wasn't gonna take them there anymore. And I tur turned my... Uh I kind of went towards the direction of where I already was in my mind and I started forcing them to start thinking critically. They would come home with the ideas that they had learned in school and I was constantly asking them questions, challenging them with the beliefs that they had. Well, how do you know this is true? Well, the teacher told me, that's not good enough. You gotta find the evidence that these things are true. Start asking questions. And in that whole process, as I'm telling this and teaching this to my kids, there was a still small voice in the back of my mind saying, physician, heal thyself. So I started taking it more seriously and challenging the uh, September 11th happened. 
We lived in a small city in, uh, at the base of Saddleback Mountain in Southern California called Rancho Santa Margarita. And there was a young lady who went to school with my oldest daughter, my stepdaughter, named Lisa Frost. And she was a graduate of, a recent graduate of Boston University and was uh, flying home to visit her family uh, before she went uh, up to the uh, Bay Area to start her new career. And she unfortunately was on that second plane that went into the World Trade Center. So I'm watching all of this going on. I'm listening to my family. I'm listening to the news. And I'm looking at this situation where someone did something horrific based on faith. Killed over th nearly 3,000 people. And I was stunned to discover that our response to it collectively was to turn to faith. And I had an epiphany at that moment, or at some point in that process. And then in 2004, I picked up a book, and I think it was probably the first time I'd ever picked up a book that wasn't written by or in support of Christianity. And it was called The Science of Good and Evil, written by Michael Shermer. And I can remember so clearly, I was lying in bed reading this book, and I literally jumped up and ran downstairs. I'm just ecstatic, and I'm yelling at my wife, you got to read this. This is what I've been saying. This is what I've been thinking my whole life. And she kind of looked at me funny. So I go to my best friend, Maria, and I said, you got to read this. This is, this is the evidence. This is the proof that there's another way to consider all this. And Maria said, well, you're just saying that because you have... Uh, you were raised in the system that uh, taught you the wrong information about who God is. I reject that idea, folks. I think that ideas should stand on their own. Actually, uh, Matt talked about that himself. I don't really care what my past is, what my experiences were. You can say that my experiences did lead me to um, being very motivated to find out the truth about some of these questions. But the ideas stand on their own. It doesn't matter where they came from, who believes them. The ideas stand on their own. We live in a world of ideas. We define our reality with ideas. We give credibility to ideas by calling them facts or capital T truths, absolute truths. But they're just ideas until they're vetted by reality and withstand the test of evidence. They're just ideas until they can be proven true through experimentation and rigorous research. So with this newfound understanding and excitement that maybe my mind had some ideas in it that were legitimate, I began to challenge some of those ideas that I had in me from childhood. What gave my father's Bible validity as the inspired word of a creator? What gave his particular interpretation validity? Where was the evidence for that? What proof did I have that physical abuse was appropriate to raise a child properly? What proof was there that women were inherently inferior? What proof could I use to justify a belief that a certain group of people should be shunned and treated unequally because they love someone of the same sex? The changes started slowly and then they came fast. Once the fear and confidence came, or the fear went and the confidence came, the belief system I had brought from my father began to collapse. I spoke earlier of an epiphany at September 11th. It occurred to me in the emotional upheaval following that attack that the mechanism of blind faith could very well be one of the greatest threats to humans today. I made that statement in a speech in uh, Washington last or a year ago in March. A lot of people got upset with me, but I, I say again, the idea stands on its own. You either attack it with reason and logic or you accept it. Let me put it to you this way. A fundamental attribute of faith is that it cannot be challenged. So if I invoke faith as justification for a belief, I am bound to allow that from all others. By invoking faith for my beliefs, I now live in a world where I must accept the idea that it's okay to fly planes into buildings, since that argument is also built on faith. 
and I have no right to challenge it. The thing that protects the people from dangerous ideas is the ability to challenge those ideas with reason and logic, and faith takes that ability away. Accountability disappears and literally anything goes. Faith lets people argue that if you're gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer, well, you're just evil. Never mind the myriad of other aspects of your life. Never mind if you act with kindness and generosity. Never mind whether you chose it. If you're a member of that community, you're judged evil and you can't defend against it. I say if you can present a valid argument against this idea, then do it or you have to let go of your faith and start using your mind. Let go of your hatred and prejudice and start treating people with justice. Let go of your biases and make your decisions about others based on their actions, not your unchallenged faith-based beliefs. I've heard prejudice defined as an attitude looking for evidence. When I consider the arguments that my family raised with their signs, I think that's just about a perfect definition. God hates fags. My father calls it a profound biblical truth. Maybe he's right. But instead of cowering, I think we should ask the question, what does that say about the Bible? God hates fags. What does this really mean when you challenge the, the notion of a supernatural being? What would the sign read in that case? The real world, world evidence suggests that there is no deity involved in the, superna or the, the uh, natural disasters that occur or the violence that occurs in this world. So if that's so, then really the sign is talking about the person holding it. So I would change that first word on that sign to I. And then we have the word hate. Again, without the evidence that a God's involved in this, then we have to look to the individual that's holding the sign. And what is hate? It's an emotion. Oftentimes emotions will elicit actions. And generally when it's a negative emotion, it's gonna elicit a negative behavior. So I would change the word hates to do harm. And then there's the term fags. Fags is just another term in a long line of terms that we've used over the years to set apart a certain group of people and call them, dehumanize them and belittle them. Before fags, it was nigger. We had kike, we had wops. Actually, it seems to me, the way they're attacking women today, that that's another word we could talk about. But the point is, the word fag is just another way of saying that we're gonna make this group less equal than us. And we're gonna justify our actions by invoking faith so that we can't be challenged. So when I see my family's trademark sign, God hates fags, what I see is this message. I do harm when I prejudge others. Going back to that issue of choice, recently more of my family has left that church. I blame you people. I also blame my father. In his search for God's grace and acceptance, he put those young people out there on the streets and he exposed them to you. No longer isolated in that sterile environment, some have been affected with reality and couldn't ignore the symptoms. And that's why I love this community so much. It's why I have such great respect for organizations like the American Atheists and CFI and Recovering from Religion. <laughs> Individuals like Chris Hitchens and Greta Christina and can we put our hands together for Matt Dillahunty? That was amazing. We provide an environment where we can process and clarify ideas that have been relegated to the shadows of our minds for so long. They provide real solutions and support for those searching for the right answers to critical questions. The very best thing that this community can do as a whole 
is to identify those resources that we have and support them financially. My family preaches a message of hatred. Their ideas tear down, insist that we abandon hope. The only proper response is to build up, restore hope, and to love one another. Ideas, ladies and gentlemen. Let me challenge you with a new idea, a simple idea. Faith is not a virtue. It allows evil to flourish unchecked. And it is the justification for too much hatred. So let me close with this final thought. Bertrand Russell, in his later years, was asked by someone in an interview what he had learned in his life and what he would like to pass on to others about what he had learned. And he replied with these words. I should like to say two things, one intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say is this. When you're studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted by either what you would like to believe or what you think would have beneficent social effect if it were believed. But look only and solely at what are the facts. That's the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say, I should say love is wise and hatred is foolish. Thank you all very much.